I go to art school. It's a rough time over here. Often we'll be handed projects we know are too big to finish before the given deadline, but we deprive ourselves of self-care anyway, and do our damnedest to pull off a miracle. All-nighters are common. During finals, students sleep on the studio floor. We've all shown up to crits with work we're not proud of. We've all stayed up past sunrise, run out of money, had to leave town, got sick, but at the end of the day, you have to crit what's on the wall. The tangible product, the work you present to the class, not the work you plan to make. When you show up to that crit, the past only serves to explain, not correct, your mistakes. So, regardless of what may have happened to Voltron behind the curtain, here's what's on the wall. The story of Voltron is founded on the theme of teamwork and found family. It focuses on a collection of strangers who must learn to come together as one unit to save the universe. This theme of togetherness is embodied in the titular robot. Voltron can only be formed, and the universe saved, when all the main characters are in sync with one another. The goal of the characters becomes to bring as many peoples and planets together as possible to form a coalition and conquer the evil force that champions cruelty and a one-for-all mentality. The relationships in this show inform each character's personal development. It's a direct correlation. Cast members literally level up whenever their bonds become stronger with each other or their lions. It's a unique way to say that we become stronger through our connections to others. I think we can heal your lion's body, but you must bond with its spirit if it is to fly again. But I thought we bonded already. Your bond must be stronger. Come on, girl. I need you. Remember what I said. You, the lion, the Okari. We are all made of the same essence. What's going on? You're booking! I'm not sure, but I feel more connected with my lion than ever. I know what I have to do! The one thing this show needed to do, above all else, was stick to this theme of power through friendship. It needed to make the audience believe the core cast loved each other and were stronger when they worked together. The copy and paste dilemma, along with a slew of other creative decisions, put an enormous strain on this theme. Up until Keith's departure, we're led to believe the Paladins care about each other deeply. There are still rivalries that need to be put to rest, friendships that are in their early stages, but the Paladins are already referring to each other as family. That I realized when we were in Voltron, we're brothers, man. You know, like we're totally connected. No secrets, no barriers, no nothing. I've grown to consider you and the Paladins my family. When Keith leaves, the team gathers around and promises they'll miss him. But once he's gone, they only mention his name when he shows up to do battle or they need to replace him for the Voltron show. Allura, you'll be playing Keith. <laughs> it becomes apparent that the cast still sees Keith as an emo loner with no other redeemable qualities. Their perceptions of him haven't changed for seasons. My name is Keith. I'm so emo. Keith would be the worst leader of Voltron. Yeah, we all have our thing. Keith's the loner. Besides, playing Keith is easy. Just act really moody. <laughs> there, you've done it. We got Lone Wolf Keith. That's you, because you're Keith. And I'm thinking your catchphrase could be like a howl. <laughs> well, that's more of a growl, but you'll keep working on it. You simply cannot base your show around a theme like teamwork and found family, and then demonstrate how much the cast doesn't miss one of their closest friends when he departs for several hours of screen time. None of the paladins allude to any phone calls. No one wonders how Keith's doing or what he's up to, even though his missions could easily kill him. It really gives the sense that no one cares about him at all. And then there's the fact that the team forms Voltron perfectly in Keith's absence. Life carries on as normal with the lions operating at peak capacity, maybe even better than when Keith was with the team. We're given no reason to suspect Black and Red's attacks are any less powerful, despite the fact that Lance and Shiro don't know each other nearly as well as Keith and Shiro do. Then Lance's Bayard upgrades and suddenly he's a swordsman. It seems that Lance has replaced Keith on the team. Contrast all this with Shiro's earlier disappearance. Because Shiro was a core member of Voltron, his departure created a fissure between the Paladins. The team had to find a new way to connect to each other to form Voltron. I felt like this arc was rushed, but at least it demonstrated how much Shiro meant to the team. It made sense to me that the Paladins had to struggle to come together without Shiro. It made him seem like a pivotal part of their lives. We may have come here fragmented and disorganized, but the only way we're getting out of here is if we work together. 
This is our team. Shiro believed in us. We have to believe in ourselves. Who's with me? Yeah! When the team forms Voltron without Keith on their first try, it gives the opposite impression. The Keith was totally unimportant to them in their success. Coupled with the team's apparent disinterest in Keith's absence, one begins to question the close paladin bonds that created the core appeal of the show. How much do any of these characters even care about each other? My mother is Galra. She's a member of the Blade of Marmora. So am I. The mutinous blades have all but perished. Are they so diminished in numbers that they're forced to enlist a half-breed and his mom? And Keith's abandonment issues make the situation worse. Note that even in this meta video, where the Voltron Paladins decide to film vlogs, they make fun of Keith with violin music and a funny thumbnail for crying over his mother's disappearance. I don't know why I'm that way. Maybe I'm naturally untrusting because my mom left me. And so instead of accepting people into my life, I push them away before they reject me. I guess I have some walls up. I'm, I'm out of here! Get me out of here! I'm, I'm out of here! With the premise of the show, one would assume the Paladins would help Keith overcome his fear of abandonment. But it's only when Keith's mother comes back into the picture that he seems to grow into himself and overcome his issues. Up until the end of the final season, I truly believed that Chiro and Crolia were the only people Keith shared a bond with. I thought that Keith cared for the Paladins deeply, but besides this moment with Hunk, I never got the sense they felt the same way. Man, I'm really gonna miss this place. That's why we've gotta end this war. And we're gonna do it with the lance that's the Paladin of the Red Lion. The lance that's always got my back. And the lance who knows exactly who he is and what he's got to offer. I was hopeful that once Shiro finally returned and the Paladins were all reunited, the creators would be able to make me believe the Paladins all loved and cared for each other. But most of my disappointment from Season 7 stemmed from the realization that they'd simply run out of time. The creators tried to address the divide between the characters in The Journey Within, but by then we'd already been through over 20 hours of screen time. That's about an hour short of watching all three extended editions of the Lord of the Rings movies back to back twice. Imagine at the end of all that, Frodo turns to his companions and says, I mean, are we even friends? We have to stay together. Why, Hunk? Are we really even friends? Is there anything holding us together besides some messed up series of coincidences? I mean, what are we? Some chosen saviors? Do you really believe that? What are we even doing out here? We can't be having this discussion now. It's simply too late to try and reestablish the Paladin Bonds. It wasn't just Keith's treatment that contributed to my loss of faith. It's difficult to believe even the Garrison trio was that close when Lance is singled out for ridicule on a regular basis, or when in his off hours he can be found alone in his room rather than hanging out with his friends. As a viewer, I definitely believe Hunk and Paige get along, because the narrative has taken time to show how much time they spend together and how well they work off each other. But even after Lance becomes a more conscious, respectful person, Pidge and Hunk are more likely to make fun of him than show him any kind of support. Through this lens, moments that are supposed to play as comedic come off as hurtful. What's happening? What do you think they're doing right now? Now? Yes. No. Wait, what? We're not talking to you, Lance. Is this doing anything? Do you think she's all right? I mean, will they be able to get back? I don't think so. You don't? He's not talking to you. Well, excuse me for being concerned. Gran, try to fire the chargers. It's just nerve-wracking waiting for Lore to get back. I'm afraid they did. What? Shiro, can you take Lance, please? Okay, Lance, let's test this puppy. Oh, I think Loverboy Lance is a little distracted not thinking about the princess. Ow! What the heck? Huh? Oh, Lance, could you stop daydreaming about me and test the connection? Ha ha, not funny. And I'm not daydreaming about you. I mean her. That's good, because it seems like Alora's got a thing with Lotor anyway. A thing? Yeah, a thing. They're probably gonna get married, you know, have babies with beautiful flowing white alien hair, all that stuff. He's probably proposing right now. Princess Alora, will you marry me? Oh, Lotor, you bad boy, of course I will. <laughs> <laughs> Uh... 
When Bob calls Lance an idiot, his friends only groan and pull faces. There is no attempt to stand up for Lance, someone who the narrative has made clear suffers from feelings of insecurity. And the paladin he chose was the dumb one, Lance. Hey Lance, how's it going? Well, you know what? I'm not too happy about being referred to as the dumb one like 18 times. Oh, it was only about four times, you big dum-dum. I voted for Keith. He's our leader, plus he's half Galra, so I think he's like the future. Keith, the leader, who do you think deserves to make it out of here, huh? Lance? Why Lance? I just don't want to be stuck here for eternity with Lance. Like with Keith, the cast can't seem to shake their early perception of him as a pompous nuisance. All these moments add up over time and work to cast doubt on the Paladin's bonds as friends, let alone family. It makes later moments where the Paladins call themselves family seem disingenuous. I, like many others, expected Lance to learn to embrace himself for who he was. He would stop comparing himself to Keith and chart his own path. He'd realize you don't have to be the leader to be loved and valued by other people. But Lance never left Keith's shadow. In several cases, he seemed to replace him outright, and even then, he was never quite as good as Keith. At the garrison, he took Keith's vacant seat in the fighter pilot class, but of course he couldn't match his sim scores. In Voltron, he took his place as Shiro's right hand, but he couldn't read Shiro like Keith could, and he didn't know how to reach him both on the astral and physical planes. When he took Keith's place as the Red Paladin, he bonded with Red the same way that Keith did, with this test. But the test occurred for Keith moments after he met Red. Lance had to wait over 11 hours of screen time to make the same benchmark. When all the other paladins are commended for their skills and bravery, Alfer commends Lance on his love for Allura. In the final season, Keith seems confident that Lance has a strong understanding of himself, but that development is missing from the show itself. Where in this timeline has Lance had the room to come into himself and discover what is unique about him as a paladin? This lack of development, coupled with his friend's lack of support, makes Lance's story kinda depressing. And that's all before Lance loses his first true love. He maintains what feels like a working relationship with the Red Lion and then retires to become a farmer. All this already gives Voltron a sort of tragic tinge, and the spread only hastens with Loder's arc. Loder survives an abusive childhood, and the moments leading up to his defeat, Allura, one of our heroes, equates him to his abusive father. Loder then goes mad with power, nearly destroys Voltron, and is left to die in an energy field where his skin melts and merges with his ship. For many survivors of abuse, this struck a nerve. Loder was a villain. He killed hundreds of Altaeans to harvest their energy, but he had a vision for a peaceful future. He had reasons for his actions, enough that the showrunners themselves stood up for him more than once. To see Loder accused of being just like his abusive parent, then killed, and brought back as a melted corpse was deeply disturbing to many viewers. Somewhere along the line, Voltron had shifted from a lighthearted story with occasionally dark or complex themes to a dark story with occasionally upsetting or even harmful ones. Allura's death was another point of upset for fans. Allura lost her family, culture, and planet to the Galra Empire, but she rose up as a force of resistance. She began the series as the team's commander, a princess. Her transition to the Blue Lion made sense. I believe she needed to learn how to connect with the rest of the paladins. But her place as the Blue Paladin should not have been permanent. Keeping Allura and the Blue Lion feels like a demotion. While the paladins are supposed to feel equal, they all respected Allura as a commander when she was at the helm of the castle ship. Some have called her transition to Blue a downgrade from commander to foot soldier, and I agree. She answers to Keith now. Then when Allura arrives on Earth, she's not treated with as much respect or authority as Shiro. She comments that she's gained a family with the paladins, but she loses them soon after when she dies. Allura was once celebrated for her role as a woman of color commander. Her demotion and death was a slap to the face for many fans, and the fact that no real reason was given for her sacrifice only added salt to the wound. It was decisions like these that buckled the once hopeful messages of the show and caused fans to turn away from the series. And now to talk about Shiro. I saved Shiro for last because he's my favorite. I'm a huge fan of his kindness, his resilience, the dark sense of humor he hides behind his professionalism. It takes more than a glowing alien wound, a fall from the upper atmosphere, and crashing into a hard pan surface at what I'm guessing is about 25 meters per second squared to get rid of me. How are you? How's your wound? My wound's great. It's getting bigger all the time. Just 
trying to lighten the mood. If you've seen my first review, you'll know I was shocked and delighted to see the show tackle Shiro's PTSD. From season two, I felt confident about the future of his arc. He was the soldier archetype who needed to learn how to open up to others and ask for help. It was a standard enough trope. I didn't expect Voltron to go too far off the beaten track. But Shiro's arc was left unfulfilled. He opens up to Lance once, but Lance downplays Shiro's concerns. And even after he realizes his mistake, neither of them reach out to each other ever again. It seems as though none of the paladins besides Keith ever move past their perception of Shiro from changing of the guard. We all miss Shiro. I remember what a thrill it was just to meet him for the first time when the two of us carried him out of that garrison hospital. I grew up with my dad and Matt telling me stories about him. He was a legend at our house. The guy taught me everything I know about being a pilot, which isn't much, but that's more on me. They never learn to offer support because they see him as a hero or a boss first, and a friend second. And he never learns to ask for help. From the first episode, Keith is the only one allowed to see Shiro in a vulnerable state, minus Shiro's single scene with Lance in White Lion. At least Keith and Shiro had each other, but then even that relationship vanished after season six. Post A Little Adventure, Shiro and Keith rarely speak to each other. By the final season, they only ever address each other formally, like co-workers. We'll split up. The Atlas will continue working with the Galra, while Voltron searches for Inerva and her beasts. You'll be out there on your own, without backup. We'll be okay. Voltron is stronger now more than ever. Rather than gain a found family, over the course of the story, Shiro appears to have lost his connection to the one person who truly knew and loved him. And that's not all Shiro lost. Shiro may not have believed he was the true Black Paladin, but he fought hard to earn the Black Lion's trust. The progression of their bond added some deeply emotional moments to seasons one and two. The Black Lion was abused by her former Paladin, forced to commit atrocities, as Shiro was enslaved by the empire of that same Paladin and forced to fight for the Galra's entertainment. Both these characters were used for another's dark ends. Together, they broke free of their oppressor. It was a powerful message to victims of trauma and unexpected for an animated show. But when Shiro returns, he loses Black. The show doesn't even give the audience a canonical reason why. Keith simply takes over for him at the start of season seven, and the two paladins never address the change. While Shiro gets to pilot Atlas, his bond with Atlas does not share the same thematic weight as his in Black's. The position was not earned or born out of shared trauma. Atlas came out of nowhere and separates Shiro further from the four people he should by this point feel a deep kinship with. The other paladins get to reunite with their families, even Keith, who thought his mother had abandoned him. But Shiro's one connection to Earth, besides his superior officer, died while he was away. Shiro was given only a couple seconds to mourn his ex-boyfriend Adam. More than that, he appears to blame himself for his death. Even, even the creators think so. <laughs> oh, oh dear. And to add a cherry on top of this tragic situation, season seven reveals that Shiro has a terminal illness. While the showrunners have stated outside the show that Shiro's new clone body doesn't carry the disease... At the end, uh, you know, we kind of see that Shiro comes back, but he doesn't have that disease anymore because he's in a different body, right? That's very true. <laughs> he's, he's, actually, he's actually disease free. We can confirm that, yeah. Yes. Disease free Shiro, all right, <laughs> woohoo! The actual story never confirms as much. Casual viewers are left to speculate how long Shiro has to live. The clip show establishes that he lives at least several years after the story's conclusion, but we're never given a real answer as to whether or not Shiro got over the disease. To summarize, Shiro was captured and tortured by an evil empire. His arm was ripped off. He became a paladin of Voltron and cherished his connection with the Black Lion, but soon lost that bond for unknown reasons. He never learned to open up to his friends. He became distant with Keith, the person who loved him the most. Adam, the one person Shiro cared about on Earth besides Iverson, was blown up while he was away. And as far as your average viewer is concerned, he probably died a few years after he supposedly found his happiness. 
Also, he's a disabled Asian LGBT man with PTSD. The message is clear across the board. If Voltron was once a story about hope and teamwork, it shed that skin a long time ago. Its failure to portray a believable relationship between the paladins eroded its themes of found family and power through teamwork, season by season, until all that remained was what felt like a tragedy. The show ends with a toast to Allura, and Karan comments that the paladins are all family, but they only appear to meet up once a year to celebrate Allura's life. For friends who conquered the universe together, surely they'd want to see more of each other? It would have made me happy for them to at least allude to some comm calls, but Keith and Lance catch up as though they haven't spoken for months. And so, that's what the end product represents to me. Regardless of what kind of story the creators meant to tell, or what went on behind the scenes, Voltron became a tragedy. We're left with a story where only Hunk appears to have successfully fulfilled his arc. He found his courage and his calling. Pidge nearly fulfilled her arc as well. She was meant to connect with the world beyond her family and her electronics. She comes away with a series with the ability to see the strands that connect all of time and space, as well as at least one new close friend, Hunk. But she's always defined by her relationship with her family. Shiro never learns how to be vulnerable or open with others. By the end of the series, he's actually become more distant from one of the few people who knew he needed support. He also got over his PTSD without the help of his friends. Keith doesn't learn how to become a leader. He departs for two years and suddenly reappears with newfound abilities. His friends don't lead him to overcome his abandonment issues. Rather, his biological mother shows up and suddenly they disappear. Besides Hunk and Shiro, I never really felt like the team cared about him that much. And by the end of the story, he loses his connection with the person he crossed the universe to save. Lance never learns to embrace his own strengths, but continues to shadow others. He loses the love of his life and retires at age 20 to become a farmer. Allura does learn to listen to the paladins and charts her own, albeit dark path, but her demotion and death makes her story deeply tragic. And Loder, a victim of child abuse, dies with less dignity than the chief antagonist, Zarkon, who slaughtered millions of people. In the end, the paladins almost feel like co-workers. They fought a war together, they won, and then they parted ways but for one day out of the year. The very core of the show was the paladins' bonds with each other, the power of teamwork, and without that foundation, Voltron falls apart. There's no emotional center to make the audience care. You could almost say they lost the heart of Voltron. <laughs> oh, oh wait. I know you can do it. There's a reason the blue lion chose you. You're the one who brought everyone together. You can do this. Every moment we've had together, they've all led to this day. This is your destiny. You are the heart of Voltron. And now for the hard part. It's time to let go. It's a rough time out there. More and more young people struggle with anxiety disorders and depression, and we all find ways to cope. These days, many wayward souls gravitate towards fandom. These are communities full of vibrant, creative people united under a shared passion. I know Voltron got me through some difficult years at art school. I could come home to the Voltron fandom after a long day. That was how I relaxed. I read and wrote fic, I watched videos, I chatted with fans. There are dangers to fandom culture though. Sometimes the mentality of these spaces becomes cult-like. We become possessive of other people's property. And when a show self-destructs, we're left to pick up the pieces. It feels personal, like someone ripped something we loved and nurtured out of our arms and replaced it with a wet sock. For every fandom, there's a give and take between the show and the audience. It's a symbiotic relationship. One gives content, and the other gives money and critique. But in the wake of this Voltron mess, we're going to have to face the fact that, no, we're never going to get closure. I doubt DreamWorks will ever acknowledge the fan outrage, much less release any unaltered Voltron content. We can choose not to consume more of DreamWorks material, but that's the extent of our power. It's their city. So, what remains within our power is the challenge of self-care. We don't have to let go of what we love about Voltron, or even what makes us feel hurt or upset or angry. But we have to find a way to function without that closure from the studio. For some people like myself, Voltron was an anchor, a hyperfixation. But it was one thing to surround myself with Voltron when it was my bread and butter. Now I look around and I'm only reminded of the dropped arcs, the last second story additions, the character deaths that make my heart hurt. I need to find a way to distance myself from the show for the sake of my own mental health. It's hard. 
It's really, really hard, but sometimes you gotta walk outside, grab a tree, and repeat to yourself, it's just a show. It's just a show. It's just a show about flying robot lions in space. And then go back inside and fix yourself a hot drink. Voltron was special to many people, and there'll never be another show exactly like it. But as more and more people move up the ranks, we'll continue to see animated series with diverse casts, stories that stay happy till the end, women of color who don't die, and soldiers who find support from the people they care about, good messages about self-worth and found family. I personally have become enamored with the Penumbra podcast, a show about a depressed bisexual detective on Mars named Juno Steele who falls in love with a thief. Although he's a very, very different character from Shiro, Juno's emotional journey mirrors what I hoped to see from Shiro's arc. Juno confronts his traumatic past. He learns how to accept help and open up to other people and take better care of himself. It's a lovely change of pace. No, nah, -uh, you do this too much, Mrs. Steele. As soon as things get hard, you try to take it all onto yourself because you don't care if you get hurt. And one day it's gonna kill you or worse. And then what's gonna happen to everyone else? Everyone who cares about you. You can't just throw yourself away, boss. You can't. I know. And you're right. I used to do all that because I didn't care. Used to. But I'm not the same lady I was a year ago, and I'm not going to throw myself into traffic for a quarter shot at doing good. Because as much as I hate to admit it, I'm better alive than dead. Which I have mixed feelings about, but I guess that's my fault, so here we are. If you have any personal recommendations, please share them down below so others can perhaps peruse some new shows. To all of you fellow Voltron fans, I hope we can all find happiness, be that with Voltron or a new property. Thank you for such a wonderful, crazy time. I leave you with this message from Josh Keaton, voice of Shiro. Hello, it's Space Dad, Shiro, Josh Keaton. I wanted to say that sometimes things don't always turn out the way you want them to, but that's okay. All you have to do is remember to always stay positive, because if you're always thinking about what could go wrong or what did go wrong, or what you think went wrong. You might miss something else that's great. You might miss a chance to do something that's great. So go and be great.